Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to episode 26 of the Engineering Success Podcast. We are live, live from New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. It's always an absolute pleasure to be doing the podcast. I know it's been a month. Right now, I'm, I'm kind of on that one episode a month pace is, is realistically where I'm at. I'm working about 50 hours a week, and I have an hour and a half round trip commute, which is a little bit more than I was used to before moving to New Orleans. So I have a little bit less time, and I'm finding myself a little bit t- more tired whenever I come home at the end of the day. And so I'm, I'm working on getting the motivation to film more episodes. I, I promise you I'm working on it. But uh, right now we're kind of on that one episode per month pace. But I really do appreciate all the support that we have gotten on the podcast. Um, Shout out to our top tier supporter, John Ott. Thank you so much for continuing to support me, uh, even when my posting frequency has gone down. Uh, Thank you to all the folks that have been subscribing on YouTube. We are up to 83 subscribers on YouTube, and we have about 20 regular listeners on Anchor. So thanks to you guys. And what up, what up, what up? We have our social media down below. Uh, As you can see, the Engineering Success Podcast is on a lot of different social media profiles. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and then Apple Podcasts. Anchor is our main distributor. Spotify, Google Podcasts, Patreon. Yes, you can support the podcast either through Anchor financially or through Patreon. And then obviously we are on YouTube. Um, Twitter, we're making a really big push right now for Twitter followers. We're up over 130 followers. And my goal is to get to 200. Yes, 200 Twitter followers by the end of next week. And by the end of this year, my goal is to have what? What? 1,000? Yeah, so it'll be it'll be fun. We're, we're, we're just trying to increase the distribution. I don't know. I've been thinking about getting into TikTok, but I'm not super familiar with how TikTok works. So definitely, if you think that excerpts of the podcast on TikTok would be a good idea, please, please, please let me know, and I will consider putting excerpts on TikTok. But that's the intro. Life's good. Maddie and I have made some wonderful friends here in New Orleans. Shout out Keegs, other Keegs, Katie and Kelsey. Shout out to our New Orleans homies. Really appreciate you guys. We might get some of our New Orleans homies into the podcast. Never know. Well, they they do some pretty interesting things. But um, for those of you that are following on with Maddie and I's life, we're really enjoying our time here in New Orleans. And we're just so grateful to be in a city where we're experiencing so many fun things. All right. So let's get into the podcast. As you can see, got a little side profile going on here. Let me know what you think of that. All right, we're going to start out with our recurring segment, LinkedIn Lunatics. The first one is titled, You've Wanted to Be an Accountant Since You Were 15, Huh? All right, so here it is. Ever since the age of 15, I've always wanted to become an accountant working for a major firm. December 2017, I set a goal that I would become an associate at a major firm with my eyes set on being a part of the big picture. Fast forward a few years and here I am. Today, although my office isn't as I envisioned, I can say I am one step close to my goal. Next step, CPA, but for now, cheers to a new year filled with new beginnings, hashtag KPMG. And they said, definitely had his mom take the two photos. Okay, so I'm gonna go with not a lunatic. You can kind of see my answer down below, but I knew I wanted to be an engineer when I was 15. So I think it's personally perfectly reasonable for somebody to know that they wanted to be an accountant at the age of 15. It's a pretty common profession. It's a great profession. Um, so no, I'd say not a LinkedIn lunatic. And I think that definitely had his mom take the two photos. You know, I, I do like the subreddit LinkedIn lunatics because there is some really good stuff on there. But I, can, I do also, I also can see that there are some people on here that are kind of either mean-spirited or i don't know maybe just oh whoa my water bottle's uh, see-through um or maybe just kind of bitter but i i see no problem with this i mean the pictures are cute um i i like his post and obviously he got a lot of engagement from kpmg kpmg is great company so 
kudos to this guy. It's a per perfectly reasonable first day at the work post. I mean, whenever I started my first full-time job, I, I made a post about how I was excited to work there. So no, I mean, pictures are, they're interesting, but they're, they're cute. They're reasonable. That's his office. Um, and I, I did a video. Shout out to the Engineering Success YouTube series where we did videos about how to work from home successfully. He's getting ready to go to work like he's going to work. He's dressed up nicely. He's got his little backpack together. I mean, I wouldn't need the backpack. That's kind of, I guess you don't need a backpack to go to your own, to go to your own house. But yeah, he's dressed up nice and he's, he looks like he's going to rock it on. So kudos to this guy um, and not kudos to this person who has a second connection with them that posted them on LinkedIn Lunatics because I do not think they're a lunatic. And from reading the comments, I'd say that, yeah, this isn't that cringy. And uh, it's pretty normal to know what you want to do whenever you're 15, which is like the age of average high school sophomore. So I'm going to go with not a lunatic. All right, let's go into the next question on the podcast. Next question is, okay, well, you know what? That's actually the end of LinkedIn Lunatics. So what I'm gonna do, that was the only LinkedIn Lunatics of the day because I just spent the last episode doing LinkedIn <laughs> Lunatics. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to cut out to an ad break for those of you that are listening to the podcast on. Hey guys, I wanna tell you about a new podcast called Tequila Time. The Tequila Time Podcast is a weekly podcast of fusion of tech, entertainment, business, travel, and more. And of tequila, of course. Dive right in as your host, Kellen and Marius, explore relevant topics to the business world and beyond. Join them in their travels around the world and learn about how new technology and the newest Silicon Valley trends. Hear their interviews with special guests possessing unparalleled knowledge within their disciplines. You can find them on anchor.fm slash tequila time and on Instagram as the tequila time podcast. Audio form and not live. And then I will regroup with the rest of the pod. All right, next question. How important is trigonometry? The college I'm going to be attending doesn't require any trig for the electrical engineering program. My ultimate end goal is to do chip design. How important is trig for this field? I'm totally willing to take it if it'll give me any sort of leg up. If it matters, I've not taken a single calculus class yet. I've got a business degree a few years back, but the majority of my math experience has been algebra and statistics. So I think it's kind of interesting that they don't require any trig for the electrical engineering program, but I'm guessing that's because um, the general assumption is that you've taken a pre-calculus class in high school where trigonometry would have been the main topic of pre-calculus. So, I mean, maybe you haven't taken a trigonometry class, but maybe you've taken pre-calculus. And if you've taken that, then you're, then you're fine. Um, additionally, you know, I think that, I think that trigonometry concepts are really important. So if you haven't taken any trigonometry coursework at all, I say, yes, trigonometry is exceptionally important because the, the, the sine, cosine, tangent, all that kind of stuff. That stuff is really important. It's foundational to your statistics class, your, your not, not statistics, all your engineering math courses, it's foundation to that. Um, your intro to physics courses, intro to statics. If you took an intro to, I think most electrical engineering programs actually do require intro to statics. Um, so I, I would say that trigonometry is super important. Now, does that mean you need to take a trig class? Uh, maybe not. Maybe, maybe maybe you can just get by with doing Khan Academy or doing some prep work on just to refresh your brain on trigonometry or to fill your brain on the basic concepts of trigonometry. But yes, trigonometry is super important for your field. And without a fun foundational understanding of trigonometry, then you will struggle in calculus. So yeah, I, I would at least review the trigonometry concepts. And then again, if you've already taken pre-cal, then, then you've done this. So um, yeah, you got a business degree, so you have some math experience in algebra and statistics. I think that you're probably generally savvy with math. So just a refresher on trig will set you up well for your 
electrical engineering program and your calculus classes. But yeah, you're, you would be behind if you didn't have that. So definitely review those trigonometry concepts. Best of luck. All right. Next question. Is a master's worth it with no funding from Stanford? Apologies in advance, as I know this question gets asked five times a day. I just graduated with my undergrad degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford and was accepted to the master's of science program. Problem is, I found out today that I was rejected from all the course assistant for funding positions I applied to. So to enroll, I need to take out a $25,000 loan and hope I get a position next application cycle next quarter. If I can't get funding at any point, it will be about $100,000 by the time I finish the degree. My specialization is in mechanical design, and I'm wondering if people think it's worth it to bite the bullet and take out a loan, or if I should just go into industry. I have plenty of internship experience and a good GPA, so it wouldn't be an issue, but I'm not particularly excited about going back to school and much prefer the 9-to-5 life. But I'm concerned about upwards mobility down the line, and I've been seeing a lot of recommendations to just get it out of the way. Thoughts much appreciated. So I did not get a master's degree, so take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I do have a pretty consistent opinion on master's degrees. I do know people that have gone that route, um, and when I talked to them about what they did, all of them knew exactly, all of the ones that thought that their master's degree was worth it have shared that they also knew exactly what they were going for their master's for. Like, I knew one that wanted to go study turbines. I know one that wanted to go study aerospace. Um, so, again, but again, I'm not, I'm very simple. I'm very heavily simplifying what they did. But, you know, a master's degree is more specialized than your mechanical, your general undergraduate mechanical engineering degree. So, a master's degree is only worth it at all. If it's something that you know that you want to specialize in so that that way you can work in that specialized field. Otherwise, you're just missing industry experience if you want to take a more general approach to what you want to do. Um, so it kind of depends on what kind of upward mobility do you want to take? Do you want to take upward mobility into a specific master's of science coursework study program topic? <laughs> So do you want to have upward mobility as a technical expert in that field that you're trying to get your master's in? Or, or do you just gen want general upward mobility? Um, so yeah, I, is a master's worth it? It depends on, first of all, if, it, if it's something that you really want to specialize in. So now that we've established whether or not the master's was worth it in a haphazard way, my next thing I want to think about is, is it worth the money? You know, I think that there's a significant opportunity cost to getting a master's and paying for it. Um, not only are you missing out on, you're not only are you spending all that money on the master's and taking out loans, but you're also paying for all the cost of living that year that you would have otherwise been able to pay for with the salary from your nine to five job. Um, additionally, any year that you're spent, you spend in a master's is a year of experience that you don't have working in an industry and you're you know, more years, more experience you have in industry, the the more that you're going to be able to earn and more more experience you have, more promotions and all that kind of stuff. So um, there is definitely a significant opportunity and actual cost there. So again, unless it's you have a really, really good specialization that you really want to go into and that's exactly what you want to work in and you know which companies hire people to do that kind of thing and, and you know that you're going to work in that industry and you're going to make a lot of money, then... I would hesitate for the masters, especially without the funding. Um, and the other thing you could do is if you re really know that you do want to get the masters and you already know where you kind of want to work, um, you have an undergraduate degree from Stanford and you got accepted into their master's of science program. So that must mean that you're a pretty good student. So I'm sure, and you said that you have internship experience and a good GPA. So you wouldn't have any issues getting into industry. I would just, if you don't know exactly what, to do yet and you're not excited that much about biting the bullet yet i would just go into industry and maybe you'll find a company that'll pay for you to do your master's while you're working for them or maybe you'll apply again and you'll get into the master's program later and it'll be funded so i don't think it's one of those things where you have to bite the bullet especially if if it's not paid for um so i would say if i were in your situation 
I would go ahead and go into industry and then maybe continue applying again. But if they really, really wanted you, then they would give you a, they would help you get funding. And it seems like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I don't want it to be one of those things where Stanford says, well, we really, really want you. So you really need to do this program. The professor's like, well, you really need to do this program or else you're going to burn a bridge with me. And if, if you're in that situation, then that's, that's unreasonable. Um, so yeah, I say all that to say, I would go get the nine to five job or whatever job and start getting some industry experience and then see if you really need the master's program. Um, Cause I mean, I thought I was going to get an MBA pretty soon after starting college. And I don't know how I feel about that now. I was planning on getting my PE license whenever I first started working in the industry. And I don't really know how I feel about doing that now. So my priorities have changed since I started working. I realized what matters to me. And I would encourage you to maybe start working so that, that before you make another large financial and time investment so that, that way you can see more of what you really want to do. So I wish you the best of luck. And my answer is not worth it. The master's is not worth it with no funding from Stanford. All right. Next question is, this is on our woman engineers. Are you friends with your coworkers? So that's a great question. So this is a, it depends for me. So when I first started working, I was friendly with my coworkers and, and I hung out with some of my coworkers outside of work. Um, but was I really close friends with my coworkers? Maybe a very short list of them, but not, not many of them. Um, and as I've started working longer and I've had the opportunity to develop the relationships with my coworkers, I'd say that list has grown. Um, but, um, whenever I first started working, I, I was going to, I was working in the same city that I went to college in. So I had a lot of friends from my time at college that were in town. So I just had no need. I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to make new friends and I, I wanted to have a, a good separation between work and personal life. And I will admit that as my career has gone on, um, that line has kind of got, gotten a little bit blurred. And I have some really good friends. Like the first people that came and visited me in New Orleans was one of my coworkers that I used to work with in my former department. Shout out Kyra and Jack. Um, but yeah, um, I'd say that I'm friends with some of my coworkers and I'm friendly with all my coworkers. Most of my coworkers I'm friendly with. Them. But really close friends, it it's a short few and it's not necessarily one of those relationships that only has been developed in the office. It's one of those things that, you know, we hang out at a happy hour or, you know, we, we, and then next thing you know, we want, we want to go play trivia together or, or go to a concert or go do something. And, and then that friendship kind of grows outside of work along with inside of work. But, you know, I think that as a general practice, you know, some people have different approaches with that. I think that just the most important thing is that, um, that those friendships that you make that you don't that you're, that you're careful with making friendships with your coworkers, and that um you know because th these are people that you have to see in a professional setting so you have to be kind of aware of how you present yourself i'm not saying that that that's a if you're going to present yourself poorly but or that i present myself poorly but you know, you, you acted a little bit differently whenever you, whenever you're at work. You know, there's a like a you know a different face that you wear when you're at work. So you have to kind of realize what that what that's like. I'm curious what everybody else on this question said. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I have friendships with my coworkers, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but yeah, this person said yes, but there's a very fine line between friends and coworker friends. I don't always let coworkers, friends know all the details of my personal life, like anything that could be used against me at work. Um, this one, um, yeah. So I, I would just, I would just be. It's nice to have coworker friends, but um, you know, you, you got to be careful what you say because you never know if something gets repeated by accident or on purpose. Um, so there's just, it's a little bit of a different relationship, but a good one nonetheless to have good friendships at, co -work, at work. I definitely have great friends at work. All right, next question. Is it bad to stay at a job that doesn't pay well because of a nice work-life balance? I'm 24 and I got my first job out of college last year that pays 68,000. Don't know where this is, but good. 
Uh, every year, everyone gets only a 2% raise, which means the only way to get a decent increase in salary is to work at a different company. Every year, all, everyone only gets a 2% raise? Okay, they are not keeping up with, inf with inflation. That's not good. Um, <laughs> and for, okay, so which means the only way to get a decent increase in salary is to work at a different company. <coughs> and for my industry, I think I could make double what I make now at a different company. However, my company barely makes me do any work, and it's awesome. It's fully remote, and meetings and things I need to get done only take 15 to 20 hours of work per week. I get used to all my extra free time taking my dog on walks, doing chores and errands, going running, playing guitar, painting, or just watching Netflix. Is it bad to stay at a job that doesn't pay well just because it's super chill? I do eventually want to buy a house and have the option to have a family one day, but having a low-stress life has been great for my mental health. Okay. So you say you only make 68, you make 68k and you only get 2% raises. So not good that, that they only give 2% raises and there's no other way to earn more, which kind of surprises me. I feel like if you got a higher up position in the company, you would get a promotion that would be a little bit more than a 2% raise. And I'd hope that they're keeping up with inflation right now uh, because inflation is a lot more than 2%. So if they're only giving you a 2% raise now, then they're you're getting a pay decrease. But if the things you need to get done only take 15 to 20 hours a week, you're really making, you know, 68K, you know, you're making twice that per hour that you work um, compared to a traditional 40 hour salary. So is it bad to stay at a job that doesn't pay well just because it's super chill? No, but, you know, you have to realize what you're doing. Um, do you feel like you're growing? If you don't feel like you're growing and you're stagnating, uh, the danger is there is that you could get yourself in a position where, say, for example, this company goes under because they don't make their employees do anything or you're not a, you have to, you're not able to do this job anymore. or This role gets eliminated. Um, what kind of growth have you been experiencing this entire time so that that way you can get back on your feet with another job eventually in the future? But I wouldn't say it's bad to stay there. I mean, 68K. For a 24-year-old fresh out of college, that's pretty good. Um, and this is just not this is not from an engineering student. This is just general career guidance. So that's really good. I mean, then again, I don't I don't know. You could live in California, and then that's just unaffordable. But yeah, I I wouldn't say it's bad to stay, but I would say that you need to make sure that you're at least growing and that you're documenting your development and growth so that that way one day if you do want to make more money then you can then you have the experience to do that and the resume that backs it so yeah I would I, I don't blame you for staying it, it, I mean it's it's nice now the question is is what kind of feedback are you getting on your performance are you are, do you feel like you're you're getting good reviews. Do you feel like you could be doing more? Uh, are you doing the bare minimum? Um, just questions to ask. Because if you're, if, if there's ways for you to outpace the two percent and with a little more effort, then maybe you should look into those. But going back to the original question, no, it's not bad to stay at a job that doesn't pay well because of a nice work-life balance. Because everybody has their own priorities, and it sounds like to you that having a I mean, you're basically making a full-time salary on a part-time job hours, and you're getting the benefits of being a full-time salaried employee. So, I mean, a lot of people would love that. Um, but one thing I might consider doing is taking some of that extra time to, again, focus on that skill development. Um, use that time to make develop those skills so that that way you can make more money or um, so that that way, whenever you're older, you're able to earn the type of income that you want to do. But for now, nothing wrong with staying there, but definitely keep on working on yourself and keep on growing on yourself to increase your earning potential. But that's pretty good for 24. All right. Next question. We have a few. Next question is 1099 internship requiring availability 24 seven. This is a doozy. They say my adult daughter took an internship because she had a job gap through the pandemic. It's a small company that works across time zones. They're paying 1000 per month to be paid once a month. 
She's being asked to send emails to India at 10 p.m. and be available seven days a week. Two days are in office, which is 30 miles each way. Daughter was reprimanded for not responding to an email from New York at 6 p.m. on what she thought was her day off. It happened to be her three-year anniversary, and she was told to respond when she came home after celebrating. This was on day two of the internship, and it was not explained at the beginning that she was to be available to respond to emails 24-7. Some of the emails have instructions for projects that are to be started remotely. <clears throat> She's also 1099, not W-2, which I understood to be a violation of labor law. I'll be honest, I'm not going to comment on that because I don't know labor law, and I don't know the difference. Well, I do know the difference between 1099 and W-2, but I'm not going to comment on that because I'm not knowledgeable on that. The worst part of this is that a relative is the VP, so just up and quitting is tricky. There is an upcoming two-day convention which requires unpaid travel and work in the convention. This eats heavily into the $1,000 per month stipend. So far, she is three days in. To me, it's obvious that this is unsustainable, but the relative being her direct supervisor and dumping work that should be that of a full-time employee on a supposedly part-time intern marketing social media graphics is a problem daughter did identical job for two years the only difference is a product change any suggestions for how to tactfully word an exit for those wondering why mommy is posting on reddit for adult daughter she is not on reddit and has no idea smiley face Ooh. Oh, oh. So it sounds like this relative who is directly over her is not doing a favor. She's really ex maybe she think they think that they're doing a favor but they're not. They are exploiting her and that's just not cool. So I think it's I, how would I word my exit? I'd say, hey, what you're asking of of me is not appropriate for the compensation that is being offered. And I don't even know what level of compensation I would accept to do this. This is just not what we expected. Now, we appreciate you providing an, a job opportunity um, to help fill this job gap, but this is just not an opportunity. This is this is not a fair or familial way. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they're not being familiar, but man, they're being terrible. So and reprimanded on day two for not responding to an email at seven p.m. or six p.m. 7 p.m. No. Um, I, I mean, on call 24-7, essentially, seven days a week. That's just insane. So, I, you know, you're a contract employee. Just give her your two notice and say, this is not, uh, this is not, this opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. But this kind of work life balance is not one that I am willing to accept for the compensation being offered and oh my gosh this is just insane but yeah i would just say no thank you <laughs> here's my two here's my here's my two weeks notice <clears throat> but, but you know i think you know internships are about learning what kind of environments you want to work in and i think your daughter definitely is going to learn that she does not want to work in this kind of work environment goodness let's let's see what the audience had to say audience had to say i would just quit on the spot no internship that encourages an intern to learn from a real world application of their skills would require them to overwork themselves all day every day especially being paid so little too late I quit without hesitation. I don't care who the VP is. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm leaning to. So, man. Yeah, I would just say, no, thank you. I'm gone. All right, next question. And we're going to do a few more. Are there any alternatives to an engineering degree? 
I'm going into my senior high school year and taking community colleges classes this year to get some of the fluff out of the way. The problem is I don't want to waste all my time in all these BS classes. I thought getting out of high school would mean I didn't have to take art, history, English, and all the other electives you take because you have to fluff out your schedule. My dad's an EE and probably could get me an internship. The degrees I'm most interested in are computer and electrical. So do you need an engineering degree to become a, a, a coder? No, you can go to a coding boot camp uh, if you want to be a computer scientist or I don't know what the term is, but if you want to work in software, um, yeah, go ahead, go to a coding boot camp. You learn how to code. You won't get maybe the experience on architecture or and you won't get to exercise the problem solving skills. But yeah, you could go to a coding boot camp and and work in computer. Electrical engineer? No, you couldn't be an electrical engineer without an engineering degree. You could become an electrical drafter. You could take drafting classes, uh, electrical designer, uh, where you're you know doing electrical plans, but you're not you're working under an engineer. Or you can become like an electrician, where you're you know out in the field and you can make great money as an electrician. But no, you can't become an electrical engineer without an electrical en electrical engineering degree. Now, let's break down the rest of this. My dad's an EE and could probably get me an internship. Probably not. Unless he owns the company, if you don't have an en electrical engineering degree, unless he's super high up in the company and has profit and loss impacts, then probably not. Especially not without an engineering degree. No, I know somebody who, whose parent was an officer at a major electronics company and they couldn't even get their own kid that was in, an engineer, in, in engineering school an engineering internship. An officer of a company couldn't get their kid an internship. So just because your dad's an engineer doesn't mean he'll get you an engineering internship, especially if you don't have the experience. At, unless it's like a super small company, then maybe. Um, but let's talk about the fluff. Uh, my favorite class I took in college was environmental economics. I learned about tax abatements. I learned about... Um, Oh, gosh, I learned about so many different things. But the, the cool thing about my environmental economics class is now that I work in the energy industry, I learned about the way that the government structures all the incentives that result in the investments in critical energy infrastructure that, that are happening now, like the scrubbing, the scrubber uh, emissions reduction procedures, our big push for natural gas, all that kind of stuff um, I learned about in my environmental economics class. I took a class on religion, and my not, my class that I took on Asian religions has helped me be a more well-rounded person and be able to better identify with and be a better coworker to my employees that may practice those religions. I I wouldn't discount the fluff stuff as you've described it. I am really thankful that I had a more liberal arts education whenever it came to my engineering education because it made me a more well-rounded and thoughtful person. And it may, and in turn, it's made me a better coworker and more understanding uh, teammate. So, I think that you need to ditch your mentality. I had the same mentality coming out of high school, but I'm just so grateful that my college education had me take classes and a lot of different things that weren't just technical engineering classes. Um, those classes generally weren't even my easiest classes. My Asian religions class was probably one of the toughest class I took in all of college. Shout out to Dr. Nadeau. Uh, but yeah, I mean, come on, man. Uh, if you want to become an engineer, go ahead and get an engineering degree and, or woman. But yeah, go get an engineering degree and and, and you'll be fine. You, you push through that, those, that coursework and um, you'll, you'll become a more well-rounded and better engineer because of it. So don't discount the general education classes. They exist for a reason. And that growth you'll experience there will help you grow. And if you took an English class, maybe you learn how to spell our, sorry, the degrees I'm most interested in our computer and electrical. No, it's or, just kidding. It's not or, it's R. <laughs> and my dad's an EE and probably could give me an internship. Well, your dad would have a better time getting you, helping get you get an internship if you knew how to write your own cover letter. So boom roasted, <laughs> but no, just get an engineering degree. Um, you'll be fine. So, yeah. Next one. For those in construction, can you still have a dog with the hours we work? 
I am a semi-new college grad that started working as a field engineer about six months ago. I've lived with dogs my entire life and I feel like I'm ready to have one again. But I am currently working 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday and have about a 15 minute commute, meaning I'm away from home for 10 and a half hours a day. While I can and typically do run home for my lunch break, is this too much alone time for my dog? And while now I may only have a very short commute, I'm worried my next assignment might not be the same. I'm also currently single without roommates, so there isn't anyone else home throughout the day. Yeah, you can have a dog. Um, uh, one thing you can do is you can pay for a pet sitter to come walk, like wag or wolf or whatever, somebody to come walk your dog during lunch whenever you can't make it. Um, but, you know, I would say definitely don't get a puppy because puppies need to pee all the time and it's going to be very difficult for you to get through that process of the puppy's bladder forming um while working your hours but if you got an adult dog then you, you would be fine um and and yeah you go home for lunch when you can and maybe on the off chance you can't make it um but yeah you could do it i mean my my dogs are adults now and, and they do just fine um i now i my wife leaves for work later than me and gets, gets home before me. So, uh, my hours, are, I work in construction, but my hours aren't the hours that the dogs are on, but, um, yeah, 10 hour, 10 and a half hours a day. Most adult dogs, especially you get a dog, you know, adopt a dog from a shelter, a dog that's full adult that, that that's potty trained and has a good bladder and, and it'll be fine. So yeah, uh, multiple of my coworkers have dogs and they work the hours that I do maybe have a slightly less, uh, shorter commute, but they have dogs and they're fine. So yeah, you can definitely have a dog with the hours we work. Next one, about ABET accreditations. I have recently completed my undergrad from a non-ABET accredited university from developing country. I am planning to move to the US for graduate studies and am currently preparing for the GRE. My concern is do ABET accredited programs accept applications from non-ABET accredited programs for graduate studies? Yeah. And how much does it matter in professional life if I complete my study from a non-ABIT accredited university as an immigrant in the U.S.? I say it does matter to your professional life. Uh, that ABIT accreditation will, will provide an extra level of legitimacy uh, to your career. And also, it would make you eligible, to, make it a lot easier for you to get your professional engineering license. Um, where, where having a professional engineering license might be an extra feather in your cap, especially if your your undergraduate undergraduate degree is from outside the U.S. But I I looked I, I've looked at a lot of engineering resumes from people that work for my company, and almost every single one of them that is from outside of the U.S. and had their undergraduate degree outside of the U.S. had some kind of graduate studies degree in the U.S. What one of them had an MBA, others had masters in engineering. Um, but yeah, m almost all of them got their, their secondary education degree from a U.S. institution. The MBA was an outlier, but they got their secondary degree from a U.S. institution that offered ABET accredited degrees. And again, uh, my experience is not everybody's experience, but the companies I applied for, that was the number one thing they asked. Is your degree pro program ABET accredited? And I said yes. So it's very essential to your ability to be an engineer in the US. Um, now somebody else said, you know, it's essential to become a PE and be, being a PE is the only way you make money in this industry. I would not quite agree with that. Um, I think that there's plenty of ways to make money as an engineer and you don't have to be a PE to do that. Um, but you know, obviously a P, having a PE can help. It can open doors for you, but it's not a prerequisite to your ability to earn a good living in the US. But definitely, uh, definitely get your graduate degree from an ABED accredited institution. And from reading everybody else's comments, it seems like it's not too big of an issue. And again, I, I've seen plenty of resumes from people uh, that have worked for my company that are engineers and that got their undergrad from non ABET universities and got their graduate from an ABET university. So if that is any evidence, I think you wouldn't have any issues. So best of luck. All righty now. Last question. Career change from teaching to engineering? I'm in my early 30s and have been a high school French teacher for eight years. I have a degree in French and psychology. 
I was either going to go into engineering or teaching. Now, like, I feel like I picked the wrong one. Family's getting more expensive every, every time my wife has another kid. You are having another kid too, not just your wife, buddy. Need a job that actually pays. Long and short, does anyone know of any flexible, accredited online engineering programs that don't cost an arm and a leg? I need to continue working full-time while I chip away at it. I've seen one at Boston University for people with any type of bachelor's to get a master's in engineering in as little as 18 months, but it doesn't seem to be accredited and costs a cool $81,000. Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, so I would definitely... I don't think that you're going to have the background necessary to get a master's in engineering. I think that you, so any program that tells you that you can, I think you need to run away from as quickly as possible, especially this one at Boston University that costs an arm and a leg. I think you'd actually be better off getting a bachelor's degree in engineering or, or potentially actually going on the side and getting your associates and i know this sounds crazy but get your associates and drafting or, or design i don't know what they're aas or um and and then you can actually work as a drafter or a designer underneath an engineer at an engineering company and then they you can find one of those companies that will actually pay for your uh for your engineering degree and they'll encourage you to take you know to get an to get that engineering degree and provide a better work-life balance for you whenever you're pursuing that. Um, and that will kind of alleviate some of the costs of you getting an engineering degree. Now that may take longer, but it might be the more affordable way. You'd have to kind of run the, the numbers and uh, and look at how affordable that is. But you know, I think it would be a lot quicker and a lot easier for you to get that associates in, uh, the, in a drafting program so that that way you could start working underneath an engineer and work your way up as a designer and then into get your engineering degree and then you can become an engineer. Um, then there's also the the online programs. Again, I would stray away from a master's. I don't think you're going to have the background and coursework necessary to be successful in an engineering master's program. There's a lot of math and a lot of just basic, you know, like fluid dynamics or heat transfer electronics or all these different concepts that depending on what specialty of engineering you want to get your master's in, that you're just going to be expected to know. Um, so I would just get it. If you wanted to get a bachelor's, I'd, I'd find like a local commuter college near you. Maybe start taking night classes. And during the summer, you ramp up your studies and you take more classes during the summer. And then within a f three or four years, then you're, you're able to knock out that engineering degree. Uh, and if you don't have a commuter state school near you, then I, I am sure that there are online engineering institutions. But I would not look for master's programs. I'd look for undergraduate programs. And the other thing is you might you might actually, depending on how long you've been teaching and depending on the teacher's salaries where you are, you might be taking a pay cut when you first work as an engineer because you are you will go in as an entry-level engineer. I, I, I don't see a reality where you don't. So, you know, be prepared for that and, and, and really try to understand what the what the trajectory is for that because it, it's not jump in. I, I've been a teacher. I'm in my 30s. And now I'm a I've, I'm able to get a master's and be like a lead engineer. It's just not not the case. So, again, I, I would recommend either looking at an online program and doing an online bachelor's. You can definitely get most of most most of the way there for a really good education uh, online. I mean, if Columbia University offers a master's in electrical engineering that my friend Nod got, um, then I'm sure that other institutions are able to offer similar undergraduate engineering programs online. So I would, yeah, I would just look for an online program, stop reaching for a master's, look for an undergrad program, and um, just kind of do some research on the numbers to make sure that you're getting the true investment out of it that you're expecting. But I think it's I think it's great that you want to be an engineer and I think that you can be very successful doing that. So All right. Well, if you can hear my background noise, you hear the dogs are barking and that's not just my feet I'm talking about. I'm talking about my actual dogs. So I'm going to sign off with this episode. I'm going to get it edited and posted up as fast as possible, but thanks for listening to this episode of the Engineering Success Podcast. Rate me five stars on all your podcasting platforms. Give me positive reviews. Make sure to subscribe. Consider donating. And I will see you 
in the next episode. I just made a pilot, then they threw me on the stations. Now I'm not complaining, now I'm not complaining. My thoughts get complicated, I cannot explain in lameness. Never losing focus because I ain't chasing payments. Still playing in the basin while I'm working on arrangements. They heard the kid in 50 countries, thank God that's amazing. But I'd rather thank Spotify, they put me on the stations.